Okay, so um, my name is Tim. That's my Twitter handle. I uh, work in Berlin as a, a software developer, actually. So I'm not a, actually, I'm not a professional hardware guy. This is just, for me, it's just a hobby. Something I find exciting. Hardware. So who of you thinks that uh, hardware is super boring? Who of you thinks that hardware is totally sexy? <laughs> okay. Uh, a lot of people are still undecided. I'll, I'll try to convince you that hardware can be incredibly sexy. So, Hadoop. Uh, if, you, if you get started with Hadoop, it looks probably like this, right? You just get a couple of boxes and, 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 and hook them up, and then this is your cluster. This is where everybody gets started. Um, most probably some machines you just had, had lying around from some users who are no longer there or something. Um, but then, if you really want to get serious about Hadoop, then you, I think you have to make, uh, you have to think about your, your situation and you have to make a choice. Um, and I think the, the most important choice is um, you have to, to, to see um, what your use case is. Do you, not, do you need a lot of processing or do you uh, need a lot of data or do you need both? So to put this in perspective, for example, I would say um, uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. A lot of processing power and comparably little data, right? There, there's a lot of data, but it's in, in, in comparison to the amount uh, of processing that's going on, it, it's comparatively little. Um, and this is not the same as, for example, say you want to render a movie, right? So there uh, you have as well, a lot of, you need a lot of processing, so I think for Avatar, they actually the uh, the Weta data center was more or less booked for half a year or something, and it's a real data center with a couple hundred servers. Um, but there's more data, and um, so this is you probably remember the slide that um, that we were shown yesterday in the keynote. 2010, 988 exabytes of data generated in one year. So where does all this data go? And I would argue that most people are in a situation where they have um, lots and lots and potentially unlimited amounts of data, but comparatively little processing power um, that is needed to process that data. So, and also the processing tends to happen in bursts, right? So it's probably not going, going on 24 seven, but you're collecting log files and then once a day or once a week, you, you just um, want to extract information from that. Okay, a uh, little bit history. This is, um, does anybody know what this is in 1956? No, no computer. This is the first hard drive, right? <laughs> it's, uh, IBM built this. It, it holds five uh, megabytes. I don't know what it weighs, but uh, it's, you need a forklift to move it. It was pretty expensive as well. Um, but this was 50 years ago. And of course we have moved on in uh, 1980. Uh, this is hard to, kind of hard to see. It's, this is still basically the size of a fridge, right? It's still pretty big. And this holds uh, 2.5 gigabytes in 1980. And it cost, um, this again, this is IBM, and it cost around um, $80,000. So in, in 1980, $80,000 would be probably, I don't know, a million in terms today, right? Uh, but this is, again, this is still 30 years ago, and we are today, we're here. You can get a laptop drive with one terabyte of data. And this is pretty amazing. If you like, if you really look at a, a laptop drive, it's like a chocolate bar, right? One terabyte, you can just put it in your pocket, carry it around. That's pretty awesome, I think. Um, but of course, you cannot do anything with the drive itself. You need more stuff, more hardware around the drive to get it in a usable state. And this is where this um, project comes in. Um, so I started this project like half a year ago, and it's mainly focused on storage. That's why it's called Open Storage Pod. Um, but it's also kind of cool for Hadoop. 
So, um, what's the mission of this project? The mission is to make storage as affordable as possible. So, um, this is something, um, this is a nice metric that um, um, Mr. Avadala from Cloudera proposed uh, some time ago. And it basically it says, um, if you expect to derive a lot of value from a, from a byte, then you can invest. But um, if it's very expensive to keep this byte around, then um, you're probably not going to do it because um, the potential value is probably not high enough. So yeah, to turn the other way around, if we can lower the value of, uh, uh, if we can lower the cost of storage, then a lot of new use cases are possible suddenly. And this is exactly what, what we are trying to do in this project. Make storage as affordable as possible. Okay, so if you look at cost, um, so this is one way to break down cost is by, um, by the type of cost. There's basically, there's, there are capital expenses, like you have to buy the hardware. It's a big amount, but one time. And then there are uh, operational expenses, which you have to pay on an ongoing basis. This would be like energy, administration, um, maybe collocation fees in the data center, and so on. So, um, some examples. There's this um, list of supercomputers, and they are probably in, 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 a, in an area where nobody of us will ever play, because they have a, they have a, lot, of a lot, of, lot of money. <laughs> this is normally like government institutions or, or, or stuff, so they, uh, they can afford to buy expensive hardware, and they can afford to run it, actually. So, like, I think the top supercomputer, Jaguar, has um, about a quarter million cores, and what this what this uses in energy alone is is gonna is gonna be more <laughs> than, than than you could ever afford probably. Um, so then um, another possibility be, would be to say, okay, I don't want those capital expenses, um, but I'm pretty fine with operational expenses. I mean, this is on an ongoing basis. I have more users than I can afford more 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 operational expenses. This is what Amazon can give you. Then, um, on the other side, there are some players who, who offer you another deal. They say, okay, you buy this expensive hardware from us. It's kind of expensive, but it's very, it's very cool hardware. And then you will have very low operational expenses for the next years, if it works out. Mm, so, for example, Psycortex had this really nice supercomputer, but they went bankrupt last year. So, Maybe it didn't work, not as they, not as, not as they expected to make it work. Um, and then there's basically uh, this, this space uh, left down there in, uh, where the capital expenses are low and operational expenses are low. And this is really where you would want to be in an ideal world, right? So and this is where uh, Open Storage Pod aims to be. Uh, so this is the motto. It's, it's petascale storage, storage with scales like to a petabyte and up, um, but for everybody. I mean, probably you don't need a petabyte at home, but I would argue that more and more um, companies, more and more organizations, more and more institutions are in a situation today where they already have a lot of data and they, can, they could easily collect much more data. Um, and they will get to a petabyte eventually. So, the open storage pod, how does it work? What's, what's the idea? So, um, the basic idea is to use, um, which is maybe not, not intuitive uh, at first, but the basic idea is to use laptop drives. So, are you crazy? I mean, you want a petabyte of data and you put it on the smallest drives you can find. Um, yeah, but uh, this makes actually sense if you look at, at the numbers. So, there's one thing that laptop drives are bad at, this is the price. The price is higher than other drives. Um, but, um, for example, if you look at power consumption, it's much lower for laptop drives. I mean, obviously, they are they're optimized <laughs> to run in a laptop, right? And you don't want to drain the battery, so they have very good, um, very, very low idle power, for example. 
They can even go to sleep. They can even go lower than that. Uh, so by the way, um, those numbers are, uh, are normalized per terabyte. So this is not per disk, but this is per terabyte. So actually, like uh, a 3.5 inch disk is, is normally like the largest ones you can get are two terabytes at the moment. Um, so this is it's half the number for one disk, right? Um, and the same goes for, for weight and volume. So this means that basically laptop drives are much denser, a much denser, like the, basically the densest means of storage we have at the moment. And so this is what we want to use. Um, and the whole thing, the, 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 the whole design is, is modular. And so the, 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 the smallest unit um, in this modular design is what we call a storage node. This is just a cube, this size, not very big. Um, and it holds 20 disks, and it holds a motherboard with memory, Ethernet port. So it's like a small computer, a small, small server, a small autonomous server. Um, and this is what it looks like. So it's, it's pretty dense. I mean, it's really, you couldn't fit much more in, in a cube this size. Uh, but the good thing is that, um, as I told you, the, the drives are very energy efficient, so they don't um, generate that much heat. So it's not a problem to get rid of the heat. It's actually the, the whole thing uh, running under full load needs just 100 watt, right? Like a light bulb, basically. So it's okay. You can get rid of the, the, of, of the, of the, of the heat. If you have a little airflow, it'll just move out. Okay. And then the next step, we take six of those nodes and combine those into one pod, what we call a pod. This is, so this is the, the unit you actually take and put in your rack, right? So it's um, a rack server. It's uh, four rack units high. It runs on, um, on standard power, and it holds uh, a whole 120 disks, which is already quite a lot. Um, so this is what this looks like. Um, from the top, you can see there are the, you can see the six nodes, right? Um, the gray thing in the middle, those are the power supplies. So there are two of them, uh, which is nice because the, this way you have redundant power, which is shared by all the nodes. Um, which is also quite, what, what's also quite nice about this approach is that, um, that inside the pod, all the power distribution is, um, is direct current. It's 12 volt uh, direct current. It's very efficient. So those are like single, single voltage um, power supplies. A and we also have two switches in there. This is for connectivity, right? So um, what this basically means is um, the, that inside a, a part, the connectivity is, is quite high. This is gigabit ethernet. And there's still, there are still four four gigabit lines going to the outside world. So also there's quite good connectivity out of the pod. So maybe like in Hadoop terms, it would probably make sense to, to treat um, the pod as a small rack, right? It's, it's basically a rack with six nodes. And then of course what you can do, because it's just this one box, you can put 10 of those boxes into an actual rack, like a standard server rack, 10 boxes. So this means you can put uh, 1.2 petabytes in a single rack. And this is, not, this is not like cold storage. This is really online storage, right? All those disks are spinning, and all the data is accessible all the time. You can put HDFS on there. You can put, I don't know, you can, basically put, can put everything on there, right? CouchDB, I don't know, Hypertable. It'll just, this is online storage. And it draws uh, six kilowatt, which is okay. I mean, you're a hardware guy. Six kilowatt for a rack. <laughs> okay, but yeah, I think you, you can arrange for that. It's not totally out of. Um, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> okay, but what you can do, maybe not a cage, but what you can do. You could um, get one of those cool containers like the, the Sun Modular Data Center, 
which has eight racks. And this means you could, you could just put eight of those, um, eight of those uh, things in, in, in a container and have, uh, this would be like, for me, the, like when I say uh, Hadoop in a box, this is uh, what I mean is, is the storage part, of course, the box, right? But this also would be a kind of nice box for um, Hadoop in a box, right? Just put a big Hadoop logo out there, and then you have like almost 10 petabytes of storage, and this can take you pretty far. Okay, so what's the status? I mean, I showed you a lot of nice pictures here done in Google SketchUp. I mean, is this, is this real, or is it just um, something I dreamed up in my living room, in my bedroom? Um, <laughs> <coughs> So um, it's almost real. The thing is, there's those are all standard components, right? Like mini ITX motherboards, um, gigabit desktop switches, um, laptop drives. Those are all, you can order all those from from pretty much any place you want. And the only thing that's missing right now is, unfortunately, a very cent a very central piece of the design is. Um, so we are using port multipliers to, to talk to all those disks. And you can get those. I have one. I'll show you in a moment. Um, but those that you can get are optimized for bigger disks. So they are too big. And so what's missing is basically just a, a shrunk down version of this port multiplier thing. And it's possible. I mean, I talked to the manufacturer in, in, in Taiwan, and they said, okay, no problem, uh, we'll make them for you if you order a thousand at a time. I said, okay, mm, maybe not right now, maybe <laughs> next week I'll get back to you. Um, but, so this is r at the moment where the, the, the real, the, the barrier is, right? You cannot, at the moment, you cannot go out and build one of those pods because this thing is missing. Everything else is there, but this thing is missing. And, so, what I did is then I tried to mm, like take a step back and say, okay, but what can we do with what we have today? And those are, there's this five port multiplier, it's just a, a little bit too big. But um, what you can do with that is um, make a smaller cube, which would be, uh, for example, an ideal home server, right? little NAS you put in your living room, it's very quiet, 15 watt, you can just leave it running 24 seven all the time. You can run BitTorrent on there maybe, whatever. And so this is what I, what I brought today. So it's it's really small, right? I call it um, actually I call it the, the so the working title is the toaster because it looks like a toaster. The, this they 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 don't get hot, right? Those are they just use two watts, so you can touch them when it's when it's running, no problem. And so what I plan to do uh, as a next step. Um, is to make this available as a kit. Yeah, you can order. You can just order the parts. You buy your own discs, and then you're ready to go to build your own mm, little cube. And really, it's it's very simple. I mean, you just need um, a standard power supply, Ethernet cable, and you're ready to go. I'm not going to run it now, but um, just plug it in. Now, I think this is pretty sexy. I mean, um, you don't have to agree, but I think this is sexy. For example, and I have a concrete use case for that as well, no, not just the, the BitTorrent stuff, but um, <coughs> maybe you, you've heard of this project, Diaspora, the guys who want to build a uh, like decentralized distributed um, social network. And I think this would be ideal. I mean, the best thing 
would be a box that you can just give somebody, like your mother, and she plugs it in, and then this is her, this is her part of the social network. Maintenance free, this would be like ideal, right? Maybe just, maybe we would set up in a way that just four of the disks are in use, and the fifth one is just like a spare, so it can internally fail over. So, just if you come home at Christmas, you just um, maybe exchange the one disk that has gone bad, and then it can run for another year. So this is the basically the idea. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show you. I'll um, maybe I'll just um, hand it around if you want to have a look, a closer look. So, are there any questions? Yes. If you plan to use uh, 10,000 disks in a container, can you access them? Uh, if you plan to use 10,000 disks in a container, would you actually uh, put the 10,000 disks in before the first one gets a defect? Um, maybe not, but it's probably not. It's it's not really a problem. For example, with HDFS, I mean, you can probably count on at least one percent of disks being broken at any one time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'd have you'd have to go in there once a week and exchange some disks, like like Google does, I assume, in their data centers. Yes. Yes. As well. Yes. Oh, he just said uh, we, we could run uh, like Solaris and ZFS on there, and then it would be very fault tolerant. And indeed, uh, I mean, the only problem is you would af actually have to use Solaris, but yeah, <laughs> or FreeBSD. Uh, this is really cool. I'll point out that actually, if you buy 10,000 disks from a s the same server manufacturer, they all come off the production line the same week. So whatever problems they have on that production line, they'll all have them. There's a really good Google paper on this, if you're curious. <laughs> Yes. The prices that you said on the screen, were they including the operational costs? So the, Sorry? the three and a half inch disc versus the two and a half inch disc, was that operational expenditure included in the, in the, in the price calculated? Or is that just capital expenditure? So, sorry, I didn't get your question. You, so you're asking about operational um, costs or? Yeah, the price that you have on the screen for the uh, the two different disk formats, the two and a half inch and the three and a half inch, does is that a, a price calculating operational expenditure as well as no? That's the the acquisition price. That's standard retail price for um, like mm. from Alternate or something. How does how does that compare with like a EMC Clarion storage uh, storage array or something like that? Sorry again. How does your pricing compare with a Clarion storage array or something similar from EMC? Did anybody get a question? <laughs> At least 10 times as much. At least, probably more. Um, have you thought about having a battery on the motherboard like Google does? And uh, so when I put the box uh, at my mother's home so, so that it survives a few hours of uh, power loss or minutes, Oh, that's actually an interesting idea. So, um, so the question was, um, have I thought about putting an, an, a battery in there, like Google does? Like, uh, so if the power goes away for, for a short time, that um, the box would still survive? Yeah, you could probably do that. I mean, the, this thing that's just going around, this is running on, on five, five volt, five volt uh, direct current. So yeah, you could probably use, use a, a battery there, yeah. And why didn't you order the thousand uh, boards? Um, isn't that th this much or so expensive that uh, you don't trust you can sell them? Well, they are $50 a piece, so that would be $50,000. Yeah, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, this is not undoable. Um, well, ask Hero on two orders. <laughs> <coughs> I, I would, f so uh, the thing, uh, like the ideal way, I, I think, would be to find a, a big pilot customer somebody who really has a lot of data and who says, okay, we want to implement this. 
we want to do, we, we want to build the first rack. And then we can order the first, uh, the first batch. Um, it's not maybe, like, this thing can be built right now because this is, this has the, the, the standard one in there. It's not a special one. It's just a standard one you can order also for $50. Well, but if you flood the market with this piece, then the market is uh, full with this. <laughs> and no, I think it's a different market, really. This is like the home market, okay. but the, the real storage pod is for the enterprise market. <laughs> Did you have a slide with uh, costs per terabyte? I don't know. Um, well, I just have this, this comparison of um, what, this is normalized per terabyte. So a, a, ter a terabyte of raw storage on the laptop disks, but this is just the, the disk itself, right? It's without the, the other stuff around. But it's, it's pretty cheap. And this, this setup costs like maybe 200 euros. Uh, without the disks, I mean. Hi. Um, oh. I'd like to make one remark to the last question, one, one minor remark. It's, it's not only the, the prototype that you saw, but if you want to go into the enterprise market, you need manageability, which means nice manufactured cases and uh, toolless opening and plugging out of disks and stuff like that. So there's a little bit more engineering to go into that. But I like the concept. I've, I have one question myself. How capable are these tiny embedded mainboards nowadays? I'm, I'm not uh, up to the state well, of the art. Are they 64-bit? And can you put four gigs of RAM onto each? That, yeah, would, that would be my question if I envision using ZFS. <laughs> Actually, the, the good thing about using mini ITX is that there's a whole range of boards to choose from because this is a standard with which is, has been in existence for a few years already. And so you can go for low power, you can go for um, high memory, you can go for a lot of network ports. It's, it's all there. It's really, there's a lot of choice. Maybe not like, it's not at, 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 at the top end, not, you cannot have a mini ITX board with a Nehalem CPU, that's, that's, that's not possible at the moment, but you can have uh, dual cores. Oh, the mic, sorry. <laughs> have, you, have you brought HGFS up on it yet? Uh, no. Because okay, so I was going to ask you your Terrasaur times, but I'll, I'll wait till you post that next week. No, I haven't. Not yet. Uh, are you aware of the Backblaze storage pod? And yes. have you compared it yes. price-wise? So actually, the, I, d I didn't talk about it, but um, the Backblaze storage pod, this is um, a design which came out um, maybe nine months ago, and which, which is what, what kicked all this off. This was the inspiration for what we are doing. <coughs> so the, the Backblaze storage pod is, is, is kind of similar, but it's, it's optimized for, I think it's optimized for cold storage, right? It's because it's for backups. And so what, what we did is basically take the, 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 the backblaze design and um, think, okay, so what would we have to modify to make it really like usable online storage on, a, on the same, same level? Have you thought about cooling this system? Because if you have it in a rack version, you have a high package density of disks and it, it's all um, mechanical devices. And um, what's about cooling of this? Yeah, well, there, there, are two, like, there are two issues, right? You have, like, mechanical devices have vibration and they generate heat, that's true. But, um, so I'm not, a, a, like, a thermal engineer or anything, but um, I figure it's not a problem. And I talked with the Backblaze guys and they said they were very worried about um, this, uh, the thermal problem in the beginning, but it turned out that it's not a problem. Not even with the bigger, with the bigger drives, which draw much, much more power. And so I figure with laptop drives, it's not, not an issue. It's just, I mean, you, you are going to need the standard front to back airflow, of course. Yeah, but that's it. Okay, sorry, out of time. <laughs> yeah, right, I'll, I'll be outside. <laughs>